remain steadfast in their convictions, encouraging uh, them to continue to pursue a close relationship with God, which in turn would lead to everlasting life. And at the same time, uh, John um, talks about something that needed to be brought up because there was, uh, they're living in a society where the world was very uh, heavy on them and the pressures to cave in to the world system and the world's values were there just like they are today. And um, he instructs them to recognize and reject the ways of the world, which he defines as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And now, John continues, and he wants the saints uh, to, to look at the path ahead. And he's, in this next passage of Scripture, he's really saying to them that there's going to be some tough things that you're going to have to face. And one of the tough things that you're going to have to face in this world is you're going to have to have some discernment because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wolves that come in sheep's clothing. And we're going to talk today about recognizing the spirit of Antichrist. And uh, that's... That's the passage this morning. So, he wants to encourage them to know that they have the Holy Spirit, but they need to be aware of this Antichrist spirit that's out there because it's very difficult to pin down sometimes. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this this morning and, and even bringing a couple of examples for it of things that are happening right now in our day and age where there has been an infiltration into the body of Christ, the church, and there's been some teaching that's occurring that is not correct, that is not right, and it's leading people astray. And, you know, one thing you, you find when you walk with Christ for long enough, and even as a new believer, you find this awful quick, quickly, you find out this out, that the greatest lies are always 95 to 99 percent truths. Because if you can get hooked in with something that sounds like the truth, if you're not totally aware of what the teachings are in the Word of God, you can be led astray. And God does not wish for that. And he said that he's given us his spirit. And his spirit will give us discernment to know what is true and what is false. So this morning, the first verse that we're going to deal with is verse 18 of chapter 2, where John says, Dear children, this is the last hour and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now in saying that this is the last hour, um, John's not actually saying that the end of the world would soon fo follow. What he was referring to is that the world had entered the final age of human history. Now, when you look through the Bible and you read through the Bible, there appears to be four separate ages of human history. There was the pre-flood age um, from the time of Adam to the time of Noah. And then we had the patriarchal age from the time of Noah to the time of Moses. And then there was the Mosaic or the Jewish age from the time of Moses to the arrival of Jesus Christ. And finally, there is the Christian age from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. And since we know that there's 24 hours in a day, when John says it is the last hour, what he is really saying that it is very quickly coming to uh, a head. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And even in perspective of world history, when John uh, wrote this, the church was entering 
the church age. So that's the final age of things before Jesus Christ makes his kingdom here on the earth and deals with everything that we read in the book of Revelation. Now, it's written by Jesus that nobody knows the day or the hour that he's going to return. Only the Father God actually knows the date and the time. John gives hints to the people about what would happen in the world prior to the second coming of Jesus. And he tells the church that they have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Now when John speaks of the Antichrist, in the first part of this verse 18, he's actually speaking about a specific man also known as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness who has been long prophesied to come into the world. And this Antichrist will be revealed to the world prior to the Christ, end of the Christian age, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to deceive many people into thinking that he is actually the Savior of the world. But the true identity of this man will eventually be uncovered. He will be a deceiver and will be possessed actually by Satan himself. And the world will be brought into the worst era of tribulation that it's ever seen. The scriptures tell us that he, Satan, masquerades as an angel of light and there is no truth in him because after all, Satan is a liar. He's always been a liar. You can never trust him. He'll always trick you, try to trick you and make you think that he's telling you something good but he has evil purposes in mind. He is the father of all lies. Today, I'm not going to be focusing the majority of my message here on that particular person that's going to be revealed right before the coming of Jesus. However, today I, I would like to focus my message um, on the spirit of Antichrist. And John reminds the people in this passage that prior to the coming of the final lawless one, that there's going to be people that will come ahead of that main antichrist with the same spirit of deception. And because the world is filled with wicked people who delight in sin and refuse to love God's truth, the antichrist spirit is going to deceive many people. He, the antichrist spirit will take people away from the truth and lead them into a path that ends in eternal destruction. And he does, or the spirit of Antichrist does that with lies because it is still inspired by Satan just as the Antichrist before the coming of Christ will be inspired and possessed by Satan. Now, Antichrist can have two meanings. It is a Greek preposition and it can actually mean opponent of Christ or one who seeks to put himself in the place of Christ. And in the context of 1 John, the Antichrist is more than just someone who opposes Christ, but he or she who has that spirit on them is one who is more than just opposing Christ, but they seek to replace Christ, that is to present a counterfeit of Christ. And this is precisely the idea that Jesus spoke of in Mark chapter 13, 22, where he warns his followers about false Christs and false prophets that are going to come into the world to deceive they will be throughout the age during the Christian era, during the Christian age, all the way through, there will be antichrists. And we can see it all around us today, can't we? There is deceiving thoughts being introduced all over the place. And knowing that the spirit of antichrist is alive and well in this world, John wanted the believers and he wants us throughout the ages when we're reading these epistles 
to be aware and understand the primary characteristics of this Antichrist spirit so that when it shows itself, we can recognize it for what it is. Now, the very first characteristic of an Antichrist spirit is that it is a deceiving spirit. I mentioned before that um, the greatest lies are 95 to 99% truth. And the first characteristic of an Antichrist spirit is that it is a dece deceiving spirit. The person who displays this spirit, he's, he or she starts out being associated with God's people, but then ends up moving away, showing that their belief in Jesus Christ is not genuine, but is fraudulent. And those who are given over to this spirit will often act like wolves in sheep's clothing. They'll come into the body of Christ and appear as though they're right on target. They'll say lots of really good things and make people warm up to them. But there is a deceiving spirit at work. They will enter churches and they will wind up splitting churches. And then they will leave with people that they have led astray with the false doctrines that they will teach. The spirit of Antichrist seeks to mislead people about who Jesus is and the work that he has done. And the way that churches, if they're not aware, can participate in this, in this falsehood is by failing to preach the truth of who Jesus is, refusing to talk about repentance and sin, or not emphasizing the cross of Jesus Christ and the delivering power that has come by grace through faith. A big one with this is refusing to talk about repentance and sin and whitewashing what is black and trying to muddy the waters, make it partially acceptable, if not white, when in fact it is black. Now, this morning I'm going to bring up two examples of what I'm talking about here. And I want you to understand there are many, many examples of antichrist spirit in the world that have pillaged the church. I mean, there's cults that we we know very well are out there that have come from the orthodox or mainline evangelical movements in this world. And it seems as though there is always itching ears waiting to follow these false teachers out the door. And the funny thing is, with 95 to 98% truths, is that people can actually take the bait and follow this because that sounds really good and that sounds like something that I've learned or I have read in the Bible. But they're missing the little piece that is poisonous. And John states in verse 19 of our text, he says, the first as, as I was saying, the first characteristic of the Antichrist spirit is it, is it is a deceiving spirit. And John states, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. The enemy wants nothing more than to keep people from believing the truth. So, where is the target? If you were the devil and you were trying to destroy and steal, if you had solidly anchored people behind your fortresses, the gates of hell, and those people had no interest in pursuing God, no interest in pursuing Jesus, they're solidly with him. Where do you think he's going to put his energies? Do you think maybe he might try to infiltrate the church? 
and take away people that are pre-believers who are just coming to the knowledge of the truth, but they haven't quite given over to Jesus. That is a prime target of our enemy. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have matured in the faith, it is your responsibility to take care of the kids in God's flock. Am I my brother's keeper? That's what Cain said. Remember what happened in, with Cain and Abel? Cain let his heart get angry and his heart was sour towards God and he ended up killing his brother. Am I my brother's keeper? That's what he told God when God confronted him. As Christians, we are, in fact, our brother and sister's keeper. I'm going to suggest to you that if somebody that you know or somebody that you are associating with in the church starts to follow something that is wrong, that out of concern and care for that individual, you should step in and say and tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. They might even get mad at you for telling them the truth. But you know something? If you do it in a spirit of love, okay, they might get perturbed, but they're going to figure it out. And if you're praying for them, and, and there's more than one person that's talking to them about this, okay, that's, that's being part of the body of Christ, encouraging uh, people to be discerning. John warns true believers in Jesus to be on the lookout for false teachers who display the Antichrist spirit. And he affirms that true believers who are given discernment by the Holy Spirit will be able to recognize the spirit of the person who is not right with God and is bent on leading people astray. God gives us spiritual discernment by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we naturally possess. But when the Spirit of Christ lives inside of you, the Spirit of Christ has a check when you come against someone who has this Spirit about them. You're going to see it. And John wants to encourage the believers and remind them that they do have the Holy Spirit inside, that they are God's children. He says in verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. He's speaking to the true believers in the church. I do not write it to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Well, what is that truth that the genuine believer has come to know? The genuine believer acknowledges Jesus Christ as both their Savior and their Lord. In verse, 23 to ver or verse 22 and 23, we read, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I'm going to bring something up here that is very important for us to get. The second characteristic of an Antichrist spirit is that it is a denying spirit. You see, there are some who say that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they're not being really honest. They're actually living a lie. They're acknowledging Jesus Christ with their mouth, but they're denying their belief in him with their lifestyle. Jesus Christ is professed by them to be their savior with emphasis on sins forgiven. But Jesus Christ as Lord, that is a different matter. Jesus Christ as Lord emphasizes a reorientation in life which includes the emphasis on sins forgiven. You see what I'm saying? If you just focus on the end of Jesus being my Savior, but I don't want to make him my Lord, okay? if you, in fact, have a true born-again experience in Christ, your emphasis will, will, will change. The Lord will move into your spirit 
and your heart will beat with his heart. Your life will be reoriented. No longer will Jesus be just something that you carry for your convenience on the outside and you can kind of live your life the rest of it the way that you want it. No, your life will be reoriented and Jesus Christ will be the centerpiece of your life. And that is lordship. I am no longer the king over my domain. I recognize that my life is actually not my domain. My life is the domain of the Lord because he has purchased me with his shed blood. My life is not my own. I was paid for with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. And that reorientation changes everything. Christ Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all. Why? Because he is God. To say that Jesus is Savior but deny him lordship over us is to actually deny that Jesus is the Christ. In our text it says, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ is a liar and that person has a spirit of antichrist. Do you see the connection? If we refuse to have Jesus Christ as our Lord and only play lip service to it, we have a spirit of antichrist that we've bought into. Lordship. Denying him lordship is to deny Jesus is Christ because the truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. The Lord our God rules over all things. And Psalm 103, 19 says concerning God, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Therefore, it is also true that each person in the Godhead rules over all. Christ rules over all. Christ Jesus is Lord over all. And this rule is comprehensive not only in its extent over space and time and areas of human activity, but in every detail, over every sparrow that flies across the horizon, over every hair on our heads, and each and every atom that exists in creation. He is Lord over it all. God the Father has established His Son Jesus as both Lord and Christ. And after his resurrection, Christ himself told his followers that all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. You see, our confessing him as Lord, as the scripture demands, includes our determination to fall before him with our lives in obedience. He's commanded us this. Concerning this principle, John 14, 23 to 25, Jesus taught his disciples about the Godhead saying, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These are the words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. This is the Lordship being displayed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. One God overall. The gospel call to genuine faith in Jesus suggests that sinners, when they confess, you see, every knee will bow and confess, and if you confess Jesus is your Lord and Savior, right, and you believe in your heart that he is the Son of God, you'll be saved. People have taken that out of context and sometimes they say if I just pray a prayer I will get into heaven but I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it that's not what God's asking he wants lordship he wants all of our hearts to be laid before him now I'm not suggesting for a moment here now you might be saying pastor all of us struggle with sin isn't that true when you think you got it down Guess what? You know, things happen, right? I faced that yesterday. I got frustrated because 
when the work bee first started, we only had five people. And we've got so much work to do around here, it was like, I, I was really discouraged. That's the word, discouraged. Because there wasn't enough hands. But as time went on, and I, and I was upset. I even said something to someone, and I shouldn't have. That was wrong. See, this is the sin that's crouching at the door. And if we're not on guard, if we let the old man take over, blah, 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 blah. The tongue is a restless evil ready to, right? It is. All of us face this, don't we? This is the truth, okay? After all, people started trickling in, and before you know it, we had a full crew of people. I mean, I should know better than that. Right? I'm a pastor. Pastors are perfect, aren't they? <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. But neither are you. Okay? So I'm not suggesting that... <laughs> so what I'm not su suggesting this morning is that if you struggle with sins and, and all that, it's not like you don't have Jesus. If you're a true believer in Christ, you're still going to have struggles with sin. It's just that sin no longer is your master. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're free in Christ. You don't have to sin. Do we sin sometimes? Yes, we do. Why? Because we're still being conformed to the image of Christ. There's a process of sanctification that takes us and conforms us to be like Jesus over time. And that's a wonderful process. But in the midst of that, sometimes we fail. So I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm talking about here this morning. What I'm talking about is a sinner who rejects Christ's lordship and authority over his life purposefully saying, I will not surrender my life to Christ in these areas. I am not going to do it. This is what I'm referring to. You see, when we do that, we are showing that we've never actually surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. And as such, we are actually denying Christ. Because if we're, if we're accepting Christ, we're accepting what He says to us, we're following Him, and we're loving Him. And if we love Him, our hearts will be pulled towards obedience. So, yielding authority to God means truly believing the Word of God as our authority, as God has given it to the original apostles and prophets because the Lord our God is true to His Word. And we're going to talk about the next phase of this because one of the things of Antichrist spirit is that it will take a portion of of the Word of God, and we'll run with it, but we'll brush aside other portions that are to go with it. So the third characteristic of an Antichrist spirit is that it is a disguising spirit. Any preacher, and I'm going to say this boldly, that you watch on television, that you hear on the street, that you hear in a church, any preacher who teaches a doctrine that is sympathetic to sin has yielded to the spirit of Antichrist. All such teaching must be rejected. Run away. Get away from it and encourage others to do that as well. As genuine believers, we're to love the sinner as Christ loved the sinner, but we're not to capitulate to endorsing or participating in sin that has kind of caused the downfall and the loss of people that Christ died for and loves. The spirit of Antichrist is trying to get into the church through heretical teachings being promoted. At the core of many of these heretical teachings, there is an attack on the foundation of the Bible. And there are some really blatant ones, really obvious ones, like the Jehovah Witnesses, like the Mormons, who have, like you compare notes to the Bible, and it's like, woo, you know, like, I am the God of my own planet when I die. That's the Mormons, you know. And Jesus Christ really is not God. He is Michael the Archangel. Like, those two things stand out, right? They're, they're really obvious. So today, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are a little less obvious. Because these things are very dangerous. Now, growing up and in my later years studying the Word of God, I became very fond of a particular preacher. 
And this particular preacher was very on the mark. Preached the Word of God contextually, accurately. I, he still to this day has, lasting, has had lasting impact on me. His name is Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley was a man after God's own heart. He's not a perfect man, but he was an excellent Bible teacher, and, and I really had a lot of respect for his teaching. Really got, grew a lot under the ministry that I went when I watched his, his, uh, his messages. Unfortunately, he has a son named Andy. Andy started out good, but slowly, things have changed. Andy has wandered from the solid foundation laid by his father. And one of the problems that are with Andy Stanley's teaching, I'm going to call it out, is that he claims that Christians should not focus or rely upon the Bible as their guidance, but on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he rightly emphasizes the resurrection as the core truth for the Christian life, but his rejection of the foundational place of God's written word ultimately corrupts the view of Christian faith. Andy, I was listening to him and I was just shocked. I was like, how can a Baptist preacher with the heritage that he's had come to this? I'm hearing him say that the Old Testament is to be disregarded. That it's his implication was that the Old Testament really isn't the word, the divine authoritative word of God. This is the Christian age and that's all that matters now. This is not. Wow. He su suggests that the Old Testament accounts in Genesis conflict with science, therefore we have to go with science before we go with the Bible. Wow. I was listening to this and I'm like, oh my goodness people, this is the spirit of Antichrist at work. And I'm not saying if Andy Stanley hears this, repent. Turn away from this. This is evil. It is wrong. Turn away from it. Come back to the truth. Come back to the heritage of your father. Another example of this, many have heard, and I'm focusing on something. There's an attack on the word of God. This is what I'm focusing on this morning. There's an attack on the Word of God right now. Recently, there has been uh, a new translation of the Bible called the Passion Translation. And the Passion Translation has been widely applauded in some circles as a refreshing take on the Word of God. And indeed, if you read the words in the Passion Translation, they're very smooth. And yeah, it jives. I like the, what I hear. But this particular translation of the Bible is not leading to an accurate understanding of the Scriptures. Because all the other translations of the Bible that are true translations are half the size of this one. The writer of this Bible his name's Brian Simmons. And he's the sole translator of this newly released translation and he's a self-proclaimed modern-day apostle of the church. And this is what he claims. He claims to have had a visit with the Lord Jesus visually who had instructed him to make some changes to the Bible to make it more accurately describe and align with the passionate heart of God. Folks, I've read some of this. I, I don't recommend any of you go into it. If you got one of these translations, get rid of it. There, it, there are phrases and statements that are made that have no connection to the original languages. This man who's written it knows nothing about Greek or Hebrew, not like the, the scholarly teams of people that are that are knowledgeable about these things that have brought the translations that we have in their various forms. There's some really good ones out there. Every translation has its own little weaknesses, but there are some very good translations 
of the original Bible in Greek and Hebrew. This is not one of them. Now, you might hear from somebody that this is really good, that this is going to improve your understanding of the Scriptures. If it was put to us that this particular translation was just that, a commentary of a man, you could swallow that. You could look at it, you could read it. There are commentaries out there that I read and I actually glean some of my material from. But you chew on the meat and you spit out the bones. It's not the divine authoritative word of God. It's not, it's not claiming to be that. It's there, well, I think this could be the possible explanation for this and this is why. Take it or leave it. Yes or no. Some are good, some are better than others, and some are absolutely horrid that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. But... This Passion Translation, because it contains a, a lot of the Word of God, it can fool you into thinking that it is the Word of God when it is not. There are cleverly designed doctrines that are implanted in this. And this all connects back to the, North, uh, the, uh, the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation Movement, the heresy that's coming through that movement, friends, stay clear of it. There, there's just all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to get into it anymore. Okay? But these are two examples of what I'm talking about. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6, and nine, 6 to 9, the Apostle Paul has a word to those of us who are being intrigued by deceiving, denying, and disguising things that are not of God. You see, because some things, if we're not careful, might have the appearance that they're, bring us, they're going to bring us closer to God when in fact they're going to take us further away. We've got to be careful. Be discerning. Paul says this. He, he said this to the Galatians because the Galatian church had a problem with this. He said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even, now listen to this, even if we, he's saying, we the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, and now say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Pretty strong words. We have to be so careful. There are deceiving spirits out there that want to take people far away from the truth. It was written in another place in the scriptures. Actually, I'm going to read John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, 24 first. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. So when we see this stuff, the Holy Spirit is going to give you discernment. If you, if you open yourself to the Spirit, you're a born-again Christian, He's going to give you discernment and you'll be able to sidestep some of this. It might take you in on first glance, but once you start looking at it, you're going to be like, wow, this is not right. It was also written in another place in the Scriptures, in Hebrews chapter 3, 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Today, we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold 
our original conviction firmly to the very end. You see, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. If we hold our convictions firmly to the end with the gospel that has been preached through the divinely inspired word of God as it was originally given to us. This will not be, it will not be said that we have yielded to the spirit of antichrist that is all around us. God's going to protect his people. John says concerning this whole passage in verse 26, he says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. They might even just be a puppet and they don't realize that they're leading people astray. May God have mercy on those people. May they turn away from that path. But for the ones who have truly believed and have stayed true to the original gospel given to them, John has a word of encouragement saying in verse 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you, but his anointing teaches you about all things. And that anointing is real. Not counterfeits. Just as it has taught you, remain in him. This spirit might be alive in the world, the Lord has given us His Holy Spirit. And what does the Scripture say about those who believe? Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. We can recognize the wolves in sheep's clothing. We can sidestep and get away from that. And if we're not solidly believers and we're just curious, you can follow Christ. You need to find good Bible teaching and get into the Word of God, not the Passion Translation. Get into the Word of God. Take the Word of God to heart and ask the Lord to open your spirit and to fill you and to be your Lord be your Savior and be your Lord. And when you do that, the light of heaven will enter you. He will give you a new heart, a new mind, a new purpose. You will be truly born again, child of God in the Spirit. And He will make His home in you. That is a promise. So, today, if you hear this message, don't harden your hearts against what the Spirit is saying to you. If you are holding out on Jesus, give Him your heart, your spirit. Say, Lord, I'm incapable of, of finding salvation myself. I need you. I need you, Jesus. Have mercy on me, son of David. Have mercy on me, O oh God, in myself. I'm broken, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, and I need to know the way home. You do that, my friend, and everything changes. And friends out there that are believers, know that the Lord is with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He'll be with you to the very end of the age. So trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and He will make your path straight. And the down payment guaranteeing what is to come is in you. The Holy Spirit is the seal of the Almighty God that has been placed upon you guaranteeing what is to come. 
Amen. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, this has been kind of a heavy message. But you know what? This is God's Word. And we need to be aware of what's going on around us. And there is a lot of deception out there. So this week, I just pray that each of us would say, search me, God, and see if there's anything where I have just been off guard and I haven't been paying attention. See if there's anything that needs to change. Lord, here you are. Jesus, take it. Take it all. Be my Lord. Next week, we're going to celebrate communion together. Communion celebrates the, the broken body and shed blood of Christ for our salvation and our regeneration and our eternal life that God has granted us by His grace. If there's something that needs to go this week, we need to turn that over to the Lord and say, Jesus, take it. I'm encouraging you to take this week in contemplation and prayer. Don't just forget. Remind yourself this week to spend time in prayer Asking God to search your heart. Lord, if there's anything, take it. Be my Lord. Lordship is ongoing. Lordship is ongoing surrender. And the Lord himself will help you to be an overcomer because you can't be an overcomer legalistically. The only way you're going to overcome is if you fall deeply in love with your Savior. That's the only way. Amen. Would you pray with us today? Jesus, we thank you for your divine word that we read here in 1 John. And we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that there is that we are your children, but also the warning to be on the lookout for false teaching and things that lead people astray. God, we know that the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. But Lord, you've given us victory in Jesus' name. Lord, you have promised us eternal life. You've made your home inside of us. And God, we want to serve you. We don't just long for you to be our Savior, Lord, but we long for you to be our Lord, to be the master of our lives, because we love you, Lord. Father, if there's something that's just hanging us up, God, we just repent of that right now. We just give that over to you. We ask, Lord, that this week would be refinement. We praise you for this day that you have made. In Jesus' name, amen.